you put the pinstripes on, you're wearing tradition and you're wearing pride. I love New York. I love the Yankees. I love everything that the mystique of the Yankees represents. He was a lion that was enjoyable to watch in action. And if you don't like it, you're fired. We've been blessed to have an owner like George Steinberg. People over the years really appreciate what an unbelievable job George Steinberg did for the Yankees. I believed in discipline. I want this camp to run like a boot camp. Since I've had the team in 73, we've won more games than any other team in baseball. New York Yankees, world champions. He is what this franchise is about, and that's winning. Most successful franchise. Congratulations. The greatest owner in all sports. The only thing that I miss more than winning is breathing. He's one of the best-known owners in the history of baseball, and for that matter, in any sport. Supremely confident and possessing boundless energy, George M. Steinbrenner III brought a single-minded purpose to the Bronx, that of winning championships and tolerating no excuses, earning him the most fitting of nicknames, the Boss. Hi, I'm John Sterling for the Yes Network, and this is Yankeeography, demanding Decisive and highly competitive, Steinbrenner was undeniably outspoken, but he was never outworked. Since 1973, he's been the force behind the Yankees, making them the gold standard of any sports franchise. They call the old Yankee Stadium the house that Ruth built. There is no doubt it was George who built the new one. George Steinbrenner, there's no new Yankee Stadium. So if you were to say to me today, is it fair to call it the house that George built? It's not only fair, it's remarkably accurate. The new Yankee Stadium, which preserves the great legacy of the Yankees, that's going to be a legacy of George and the Yankees. He came to opening day and uh, had a great time. And like all of us walking in there the first time, I think he was just struck by the, the majesty of it. Well, that's what New Yorkers expect out of this organization. He looked at me and he said, it's Yankee Stadium. More than that, I couldn't have asked for. Every Coliseum needs an emperor. For Yankee Stadium, it's George M. Steinbrenner III, best known as the boss. The boss, he's the intimidator. He's a man with a plan, full control of the direction that he wanted to take everything. I know I'm hard on him, and I never congratulate him and pat him on the back. I'm not that kind of a leader. I guess I'm more of a pat than I am an Eisenhower. And he projected that. He has a very strong personality. When he entered the room, everybody knew that. That's the type of presence that he commanded. I don't know that I'll have the love of my players. I'm not really looking for that. You knew if you weren't doing your job that he was going to say it. He wasn't going to wait for a teammate to say it or, or a coach or the fans. He was going to put it out there first. I'm looking for the respect, and it would hurt me if I don't have the respect. He changed the whole culture around there in terms of how things were going to be run. Team discipline is needed. I'm a great believer in it. And I, I have many people tell me we're too strong on discipline. I don't believe it. He's very difficult to work for. If you're not as demanding of yourself in any capacity, then you're not going to last very long with George Steinbrenner. We expect a lot of our players. That's the thing they got to understand. We want them to perform for their own good, for the team's good, and for their fans' good. Nobody works harder. This guy, I don't know how he did it. He, 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 he could outwork everybody. Even when we won World Series, after the parade, it was all about, what do we do next year? You know, we got to make sure everybody's going to be ready. I want this camp to run like almost a boot camp. Mr. Steinbrenner challenges everyone. He feels it's his responsibility to get the most out of the people who work for him. Whether you're playing third base or the grounds crew guy that cleans the dirt at third base, you're expected to be the best at what you do. One of the things that he instilled in you as a player was, I'm going to be the toughest person you'll ever face. If you can stand up to me toe-to-toe, -to -toe, you're going to be fine because you can beat anybody else. He's a role model for anyone who's uh, trying to aspire to be the best at what they do. I know he's an inspiration to me and to all the players on my team. 
you sort of had to prove yourself all the time to George, and I think that was his plan, is to make sure that you never got comfortable. And it worked. He's the Vince Lombardi of owners, maybe of baseball, period. George Steinbrenner is the most influential owner in all of sports. He I felt this great responsibility that the Yankees have to be champions. Now, I never made any bones about free agency. I said, I'm going to participate. Now, some of these fellas said, oh, we're not going to have any part of it. He was the visionary for free agency. He was the guy who wasn't afraid to pay big salaries, wasn't afraid to go against the other owners. He did what he wanted to do because it was all in the name of winning. George Steinbrenner did what he thought he needed to do to be successful. The cost was unimportant. The result was what it was about. If we need a pitcher, he went out and got the best pitcher that was available. We need a hitter, he went out and got the best hitter that was available. When a guy driving a cab or working on a building in New York yells down, "Out a boy, do this or do that, that's important to me. He had the mindset where you should win every single day, and uh, he expected that to do whatever it took to put the best players on the field, and he expected us to do our job. And I want them to know I'm involved because I'm like they are. I die when we lose, just like they do. The fans got to see a better product on the field because he pushed the free agent system and he poured all of his money back into the game. Other teams' fans wish they had George Steinbrenner as their owner. He's, he's made the Yankees into the measuring stick. Whether they win or lose, they're the team that everybody looks to, to measure themselves against. Steinbrenner always understood that the media was his pipeline to the fans, and he took full advantage of it. He knew what stories to get out there to deflect attention from other things. Every time you change, replace a manager, headlines for a week. All right, now, the, you, a good thing. Don't say replace, say shift, change. Shift. He knew when to put himself into the spotlight. Change. See, when most teams fire a manager, they let him go. He's on the street. His family's on the street. His kids are on the street. Where's the next meal coming from? Hopefully they'll latch on somewhere else. We don't do that. You know, he seemed like he did the right thing at the right time in getting the attention on him. We start over. Wells was pretty popular with him and teammates. And who are you and who do you write for? The Orlando Sentinel. Oh, what do you know about the New York team? He always knew that to get people to fill the stadium, even in years when they might not win, you've got to be on the back page. You've got to be controversial. You've got to be in the news. I like the fact that they did very well the first year back. Uh, and I know that you're one that thinks that just because I came back, right? You almost wish that he could have taught a college course on it because it's sheer genius. And your reaction to those names was? Was what? Did your knees buckle? No, my knees didn't buckle. My knees don't buckle. There certainly will never be another owner, ever, that will create as much publicity as my dad did, and that's the bottom line. If you look at the way he managed the media, it's no accident that the Yankees have become, in the time that he owned the team, probably the greatest brand in sports, for sure, and one of the top five brands in, in all of the world. I think that baseball is basically showbiz. When we get to the day, it's no longer just a sport. It's entertainment today. He was the person who took the brand of the New York Yankees and brought it to heights where people thought the brand could never go. He actually took this brand, which is the New York Yankees, and added more championships, plus a network, plus a brand new stadium, plus record attendance, and, and uh, we're world renowned. If you go in Venice on the canals, they all have Yankee hats for sale. I mean, it's everywhere in the world, and it is a brand, and he has kept it traditional, classy, and what it should be. We've been the one team that has kept bigger than life. We're the New York Yankees. He has made a name for himself, and rightfully so, that's just going in line with, with all, the all-time Yankee greats. And that's almost impossible to do when you're not a player. It was a low-key press conference that took place in 1973, but it ushered in a new and most eventful era of Yankees baseball. CBS has agreed to sell the New York Yankees uh, to a group of individuals headed by uh, George Steinbrenner, who's here with me. I knew his name from being from Ohio, but I didn't really know him. I didn't know what kind of pressure he was going to put upon us, and I didn't know what his will to win was. Uh, I later found out. CBS has agreed to sell the New York Yankees uh, to a group of individuals headed by uh, George Steinbrenner. Little was known about this 42-year-old shipbuilder born in Rocky River, Ohio, to Rita and Henry Steinbrenner, who instilled in him the importance of hard work. 
My grandfather was a very tough German man. He was a typical German, you know, do better, do better, do better. Henry was president of Kinsman Marine Transit Company, and his relentless work ethic was succeeded only by the desire for his children to succeed. He used to have an old saying to me, pay attention to detail. Don't worry about tripping over the elephant. Worry about tripping over the little mice. Henry always envisioned that George would someday take over the business, and he often gave his son advice to prepare him for the task ahead. It was a lesson George took to heart in his very first business venture. In order to get allowance, so to speak, he had to raise chickens and had to sell the eggs. So if you can imagine George raising chickens. <laughs> but Henry wasn't all business. Quite often, he would take George to Cleveland for an Indians game. I was a Cleveland fan. I had my favorites on the Indians, Roy Weatherly, Hal Trosky. But when the Yankees would come to town, my dad would take me to League Park. But he always instilled in my father, we root for the Indians, but we don't go to boo the Yankees. You show them respect because they represent excellence. Henry, a former track and field star at MIT, encouraged his son to take up sports, not for fun, but to win. He idolized my grandfather. He idolized his dad and constantly tried to please him. If I'd run five races and win four, his question would be, how did you get beat? And I think a lot of that carried through to my dad, but my dad has always had a gentler side. And that came from his mother, Rita Steinbrenner. She was just a sweetheart. I mean, just the nicest person you'll ever meet in your life. She was the calming influence of the whole family. She was very sweet, very patient, had to be living with my grandfather. So there's no doubt she taught him a lot about the other side of life, and that's why he's probably a pretty well-balanced person. George took the life lessons from both parents to Culver Military Academy in Indiana. He went on to attend Williams College, where he continued to play sports and even became a sports editor for the student newspaper. He loved being able to express his opinion in the columns, and as we all know, after he became owner of the Yankees, he was still writing the newspapers. After earning his degree from Williams, followed by a stint in the Air Force, George moved on to Ohio State, where he would meet the love of his life. The first person he really wanted to get to know was Hopalong Cassidy, who had won the Heisman Trophy in 1955. They were close at Ohio State. Yeah, they got close, my dad and Hop. It was Hoppy who introduced George to Joanne, his wife. She was homecoming queen there, very smart, very pretty. I think that's what George liked about her, and uh, probably a lot of other things, you know. <laughs> With Joanne by his side, George pursued his other new love, coaching. I went to Northwestern as end coach for Lou Saban. He was a great leader. I enjoyed being the end coach. We worked hard, but we weren't successful because we didn't have the material. And that taught me you have to lose sometime if you don't have the proper material. But if you have the proper material, you should win. Well, if that dock goes over 1,000 feet, are we going to go up into those buildings? George eventually returned home to work for his father and in time became president of Kinsman. Though he was quite successful, the world of sports still beckoned. He first tried his luck in basketball, purchasing the Cleveland Pipers in the American Basketball League. But even after signing two-time College Player of the Year and Ohio native Jerry Lucas, his ABL venture would fail. And that's when he turned to baseball. I was negotiating with Jim Stouffer, and I had Al Rosen and some very big men in Cleveland, and we wanted to try and buy it. He thought he had a deal with Vernon Stouffer to buy the Indians, and at the last minute, Stouffer reneged on the deal. And then came a twist of fate, for the team he admired as a child became available. So then one day, Gabe Paul invited me to come down to the stadium. He said, the Yankees are for sale. I said, you're kidding me. George immediately made it clear he was interested in purchasing the game's most historic franchise from CBS, and team president Michael Burke arranged a meeting at the network's headquarters. He set up an appointment for to meet, to meet Bill Paley. He said, I understand you want to buy the Yankees. I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, are you here with Chinese paper? So I said, I'm here with as much cash as I got. He said, that's what I like to hear. I stood up and we shook hands and we made the deal. Guys, Dick Young and all those great writers sitting there in front of me as though I was going to tell them something, a shipbuilder from Cleveland. It's important to me, it's important to all of us, and it's particularly important to New York and to the Yankees that the group 
that gets behind the Yankees at this point have the wherewithal and the interest to get the kind of job done that the sports writers, that the fans, that the city and the media uh, in New York deserve. And I said to him, I'm going to put you guys in the championship. Give me three years. And I hadn't seen the team yet. First day I saw the team, it looked like it should put the team picture as a poster for birth control or something. Geez, we had a second baseman who I really loved, Forrest Clark, who wore his batting helmet on defense. So I said to myself, my God, what are we into here? There was minimal interest in them. Attendance at Yankee Stadium was way down. CBS just didn't seem to care about the Yankees. It was like some old TV show that was in reruns. There is no doubt that with Steinbrenner at the helm, things would change. Just not the way he led folks to believe. We're very honored to be associated with the Yankees. When asked about his involvement, he said that he's more like an absentee owner. He will have no involvement with the New York Yankees. And I think that was true for the second that he mentioned it. When we came in here, I got laughed at by a lot of people because I believed in discipline. I want this camp to run like almost a boot camp. I want it to be strict. I don't want to see long hair if they can't keep it neat. I have nothing against long hair, but I find it difficult to believe that a ball player can, just leave alone, can keep it neat when he's playing. George didn't know the players by name or by looks, so he wrote down the numbers of the players that he thought needed haircuts. And I was one of them. Bobby Mercer was one. I think Stoudemire was one. I didn't know Mr. Steinbrenner at all. I'd just been traded there. And joking around, I said, our Lord Jesus Christ had long hair, and things seemed to work out for him. And didn't say a word. He says, come with me. And I walked across the street to the Fort Lauderdale swimming pool, and he says, you can walk across that water. You can wear your hair any way you want. So we could see that things were going to be a little different. He was going to be a hands-on guy. I want him to be representative of New York. I want them to go everywhere and have everybody say, well, they're the New York Yankees. One thing my dad appreciated from the very beginning was the history here and the class. You go over to our minor league complex across the street, and the minute we get these kids into our system, we pound that into their head, you were a New York Yankee. I want you to get used to the winning tradition because it's important. When you put the pinstripes on, you're not just putting a baseball uniform on. You're wearing tradition and you're wearing pride. Rob Houck was Steinbrenner's first manager, but he only lasted the year. And in 1974, Bill Verdon took over, though not for long. Even though Bill Verdon seemed to have been the perfect manager for George because of his discipline, Verdon was very laid back, and George kept complaining about the fact that Verdon had no fire. I want a guy with fire. Then the worst thing that could have ever happened to Bill Verdon is Billy Martin got fired in Texas. Now, all of a sudden, Billy is available in 1975. George leaped at the opportunity to get Billy over there. Billy was brilliant, brash, and hell-bent on winning. And to that end, George had found a manager who shared his passion and singular focus. He was a former Yankee. I loved him as a player, die-hard Yankee, and a great hip-pocket, seat-of-the-pants guy who really knew how to manage a team, who really knew how to inspire. He was a marquee manager, and that's what Steinbrenner wanted, and it was part of the overall scene. You needed a star manager, you needed star players, and he wanted to have his group of marquee attractions. With Morton in place, general manager Gabe Paul continued his makeover of the Steinbrenner Yankees. The team continued to acquire players who would eventually play key roles on championship teams. As for the owner himself, he began to dabble in the all-new world of free agency. He, before anyone else, understood how free agency had transformed the game and could transform the fortunes of a team. After the 1974 season, Oakland's sensational pitcher Catfish Hunter became a free agent thanks to a technicality that impacted his contract with the A's. George wasted no time in signing the biggest fish in the sea, a move that made perfectly clear his determination to build a winner. The signing of Catfish was gigantic because he not only was a great pitcher, he was one of the consummate competitors of a generation. So George got himself the Hope Diamond of pitchers at that time in terms of winning. 
Cat was the foundation. He helped us get started. He was the building block that I needed at that time, the foundation for the championships. Hunter's new catcher, Thurman Munson, was like Steinbrenner, a fellow Ohio native. His gruff demeanor and intolerance for losing endeared him to the boss, and in a closed-door meeting in 1976, George sought to reward him, defying what to that point had been an accepted Yankee tradition. I was probably the only one in the room who knew this obscure little Yankee legend that when Lou Gehrig had passed away in 1941, Joe McCarthy, his manager, said, and with Lou goes the position of Yankee captain, there will never be another Yankee captain. And Mr. Steinbrenner had the perfect answer. He looked at me and he said, if Joe McCarthy knew Thurman Munson, he'd know this is the right guy and this is the right time. He always would come in unshaven. I don't want to be captain. I said, Thurman, we need somebody to lead us. We need a leader or we're not going to make it. Finally, he says, I don't want to be the captain. He walked. I said, well, that's too bad. I'm paying you and you're going to be the captain. Well, not only was Thurman the captain that year, he was also the league's most valuable player. As for Catfish, he won 17 games, and the two of them helped lead the Yankees to the World Series, and just one year later than Steinbrenner's three-year prediction. Fish Jambless has won the American League pennant for the New York Yankees. The champagne was going everywhere, and Steinbrenner was embracing everybody. He was just in his glory because not only had they won the pennant, but they did it in such dramatic fashion, and he took a lot of pride in it because it was his doing in a lot of ways. But the jubilation was short-lived as the big red machine of Cincinnati swept them in the World Series. That prompted the new Yankee captain to make a personal request of Mr. Steinbrenner, asking the boss to please make the move to put a certain free agent, a very big bat, behind him. Coming up on Yankeeography. I hate to lose. I'm like a Yankee fan. My foot has gone through a number of television sets in my time. The 1976 season had ended with the Cincinnati Reds sweeping the Yankees in the World Series. And no one felt worse than the boss. I hate to lose. I'm like a Yankee fan. My foot has gone through a number of television sets in my time. George had hooked Catfish Hunter for the 75 season, once again looked to the free agent market in search of that final piece of the puzzle to put New York over the top. Free agency was a part of the game. I never made any bones about it. I said it's like the bat and ball and the glove. If it's part of the game, it's in the rules, I'm going to use it. The jewel of this free agent class was Reginald Martinez Jackson, and Reggie was intrigued. George Steinbrenner's a hustler. He's put together a great team, and no matter what you say, the cat is, he's out there hustling. We went around the city, and it was like it was choreographed. People stopped on the streets. Hey, Reggie, we need you in New York. Come on to New York. We're the Yankees. This is the place for you. And George took me around a bunch of his high roller friends, and we went to this place called 21, and I shook his hand. The fact that people associate me with winning speaks for itself. Reggie, of course, became a Yankee. But once he donned the pinstripes, George realized he had a clubhouse full of both talent and tension. And Reggie always seemed to be at the center of it all. There was a lot of conversation about problems early on with Thurman Munson and many of the other teammates. Much of it emanated from an article during spring training in which Reggie reportedly said that he, not Munson, was the straw that stirred the drink. This immediately polarized the team. And then there was the ongoing love-hate relationship that developed between Reggie, George, and skipper Billy Martin. I'd been through a real year between he and Billy, Billy and he. You know, George hates Billy, Billy hates George. Reggie doesn't like George, Reggie doesn't like Billy. Back and forth was a headline every day. And that, that uh, scene in Boston, that was unbelievable. Billy felt that Reggie failed to hustle on a fly to right and yanked him from the game, and a national television audience watched it unfold. He just took Reggie Jackson out of the ball game, and Jackson hit the top step of the dugout and went flying right at Billy Martin. The clubhouse was christened the Bronx Zoo because of the wild atmosphere and headstrong personalities that inhabited it. 
sure we had a few guys that you might classify quasi-renegades, you know, because they said what they thought, that's what they were hard-nosed. But for all the craziness, this dysfunctional family was on the cusp of a championship. And once they reached the Fall Classic, George would be vindicated for bringing Reggie into the fold. Reggie Jackson is a doer. He wasn't just a talker. There wasn't enough mustard in the world to cover him. He was a hot dog. But what a great hot dog he was. When he hit those three home runs and he looked like this, I know he was probably pointing up to God, but I always thought, well, maybe he's pointing at me because I was sitting up there. I'm proud for baseball, for the Yankees, and for New York. It's been a great tough year. That it's been, but uh, as long as it's culminated by this, I'm sure you're, you're, more, you're more than happy. Worth it all. The 1978 season seemed to share the same promise for George and the team. Once again, he had snared the prize-free agent in Rich Gossage, but Goose got off to a rocky start. When I first joined the Yankees, uh, man, I stunk the joint up. I'd come to the mound in Munson and say, how are you going to lose this one? George was not pleased. And he became a frequent visitor in the clubhouse, relying in part on the intimidation techniques he employed as a football coach to get his point across. It was actually chaos in our clubhouse because of all the things surrounding the Yankee team. But you remember, this is the owner of the team. It's a big business. He has to run that business as well as he sees fit. So if he wants to come in there every once in a while and chew some butts, you know, he has the privilege of doing that. You hated to see him coming. You know, I remember one time specifically, man, he comes in and he stands right in front of my locker. Well, the whole tirade was kind of aimed at me. And, uh, you know, I'm paying you all this money, and he's screaming and ranting and raving. And I look across at Thurman, and every time he would turn his back, Thurman would make all these funny faces. I was sweating bullets. But there was nothing funny at all about the simmering feud between Billy and Reggie, which finally reached the boiling point. Remember him getting a bunt sign and then missing it, and then the bunt not being on that Billy had changed the sign, so he tried to bunt anyway, even with two strikes, and he ended up striking out. Billy was furious and suspended Reggie for five games, but it was Martin who bore the brunt after calling out both his superstar slugger and his owner in the press. At George's behest, I went out to tell Billy that he was finished. Billy, I think, saw the handwriting on the wall and resigned prior to my meeting with him. I would like to thank the IT management, the press, the news media, my coaches, my players, and most of all, George called upon Bob Lemon to replace Martin, and the Yankees responded to their new skipper's mellow style by staging one of the greatest comebacks in baseball history. It resulted in a division tie and a one-game playoff, but the venue made George leery. The playoff game would have to be up in Boston, and I didn't like that at all. I was really down because we were going to have to fly up there. So I came out of the stadium that night, walked into my car in the parking lot, and here's Gidry. And he said, what are you so down about like that? I said, well, what the hell do you think I'm down about? We got to go up there and play those, whatever I call them. And he said, don't worry, boss. Don't worry. I'm going to beat them. Boy, that lifted me, and then I was full of fight. That was one of the greatest baseball games I've ever seen. Deep to left. Yastrzemski will not get it. It's a home run. Manella's after it. And he's got it. What a catch. He'll squeeze it, and it's over. New York went on to capture its second straight title in 1978, and George was thrilled for both the team and its loyal fans. George Steinbrenner, the principal owner. Congratulations, George. A real honor for your two consecutive years world champion. Thank you. I'm just proud of New York and happy that these guys battle back because New York's a city of battlers. And hello to everybody in New York. You couldn't blame the boss for dreaming of a three-peat as the 79 season got underway. Billy Martin would return mid-season, 
but winning became insignificant in August when George faced a tragic loss. New York Yankees and sports fans everywhere suffered a great loss tonight, that of star catcher Thurman Munson, who was killed this afternoon in an airplane crash. I was really shook, but if somebody had to tell the players, I figured it should be me, I'm the guy that should stand up and tell them about Thurman's death. After he composed himself, he called everybody together, and it was just like he was George Patton. He was designating assignments, you gotta go here, you gotta go there, uh, we gotta get a charter going to Canton for the funeral. I called the powers to be, and I told them we're gonna fly out to Thurman's funeral. And Billy's going, the whole team. They said, well, we can't allow that, because what if you don't make it back? I said, well, then tough we don't make it back, we forfeit. George also took the lead in orchestrating the next day's pregame ceremony. He presided over everything, from the black armbands to the scoreboard tribute to the fallen captain. We pause to pray for Thurman Munson. sad day and you know George was the guy that was there and his presence you know certainly helped all of us George did his best to heal the hearts of the entire Yankees family but Thurman's death was a somber end to what had been an unforgettable era Second time in two years, George fired Billy Martin in October of 79. He was replaced by Dick Hauser, and George was confident that Hauser was the right man for the job. Dick Hauser's gonna fill the bill and be one of the best managers in baseball. And he certainly looked like the best, guiding the Yankees to a 103 win season. But their World Series dreams were cut short by Kansas City and George Brett. Brett's home run was a key moment in the Royals' LCS sweep. And years later, Steinbrenner made it clear to Brett that he never forgot the role he played. He said, he hates me. George, why do you hate me? Well, you hit that home run off us in the 80 playoffs. I said, George, you won in 1976. You won in 1977. You won in 1978. We won in 1980. Can't we win one out of four times playing you guys? You know what his answer was? No. With the pain of defeat still fresh in his mind, the boss wasted no time retooling the team for the 81 campaign. The next morning, I had everybody in the office at 8.30, and Phil Pepe, who was a great sports writer, poked his head around the corner and said, what the hell are you all doing here? I said, we're getting ready for next year. And uh, that's the way we operate. One of the first moves Steinbrenner made was to zero in on the best free agent on the market. And just like that, former Padre Dave Winfield became a Yankee. Remember that number. You're going to see a lot of it. The galaxy of Yankee stars had grown by one, and the contract Winfield signed made him the highest paid player in all of baseball. It was a 10 year contract uh, for about 23 million. But then confusion arose regarding a stipulation in the contract. George did not understand the significance of one of the provisions of the contract. The boss contested the clause and asked that the contract be revised, and Winfield acquiesced. It ended up being less money for me, because I said, I'm going to be here 10 years, and I'm a team guy, I'll work with them and everything else. And then there's a strike. The Yankees would play just 107 games that year, but by season's end, they once again had reached the fall classic. The Yankees have won the pennant! Ah, uh, but after back-to-back -back defeats at the hands of New York, L.A. got its revenge. The Dodgers are the 1981 champions of baseball. This one hurt the boss so much, he felt obliged to apologize to the fans for the failure of his team to win it all. And Winfield, who went one for 22 in the series, bore the brunt. If they're going to get all the headlines and all the glory in public, then they have no reason to expect not to take some of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. George went right to work, looking to re-sign Reggie Jackson. But when Reggie wanted added security, George let him go. 
It was a watershed moment in Steinbrenner's life. And that was one of the worst mistakes I ever made. Reggie became an angel. And upon his first visit back to the Bronx, he made certain to remind the boss of his error in judgment. Reggie hits one out. First pitch. Upper deck. Fans really got on him after I hit the home run, and he was embarrassed. He didn't embarrass easy. Recognizing his mistake, Steinbrenner became even more passionate about building a championship franchise. But the decade that followed could not match his passion. He would have moved heaven and earth in order for them to win. And his pursuit of that winning forced him to do things that weren't good for the team. And that's what started the Yankees spiraling down. Steinbrenner's, Steinbrenner's myriad signings brought plenty of new names to the Bronx, but failed to produce the ultimate goal. While constantly tweaking the roster, Steinbrenner also kept searching for the right manager. And that once again led him back to Billy at a memorable and entertaining press conference. It's my pleasure to announce today that uh, the manager for the Yankees on a multi-year contract will be Billy Martin. We straighten a lot of things out. For instance, I'll be handling all the trades. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, there'll be no phone calls in the dugout. What do you mean? That is not... No, that's not right. <laughs> I'm handling the trades. That isn't the way we say it, I have it, the right to call you in the dugout. Oh, and that's not the way it's going to be, George. Well, you're damn right it is, and I'm, if you don't like it, you're fired. You haven't hired me yet. <laughs> so I just want you to know this is the way it's going to be. But the playful banter that kicked off Billy's third go-round with the boss didn't last long as Martin was let go at the end of the 83 season and replaced by another Yankee legend. But just 16 games into the 85 campaign, Yogi too was dismissed. And the manner in which it happened left him angry and hurt. Well, I felt bad, you know, that I got fired twice before, but the owners called me. See, George didn't call me. I didn't take it right. I said, I'll never go back to the stadium. The constant changing of the guard and the Yankees' inability to reach the postseason exacerbated Steinbrenner's impatience and his disdain for failure. Nobody in baseball likes to lose, but George takes it awfully harder because his passion was to provide Yankee fans with a winner year in and year out. Every move you make isn't right. I don't know anybody that's perfect in life. I certainly am not, and I'm ready to admit it. But you do the best you can. But the 80s weren't always about the manager du jour and meltdowns. In fact, the Yankees won more games than any other team in baseball in the decade. They just couldn't win at all. But George did get quite a treat on the day he turned 53, the 4th of July, 1983, when Dave Rigetti provided him with a very special birthday gift. was there that game so I have to say it was magical it's magic and on his birthday I mean he's the most patriotic person I've ever met in my life Rigetti's timely gem was a proud moment in a roller coaster of a decade one that included the return of Martin in 85 and once again in 88 that was a classic love-hate relationship between two people when they were together they were like this but when they were apart they realized how much they missed each other and needed each other their unique kinship was so great, in fact, there was even talk of Billy coming back to manage for a sixth time. But unfortunately, that never came to be. When Billy passed away the way he did, in such a violent way, and on Christmas Eve, and uh, I think it, it really, it took a lot of George with him. That was how important Billy was to George Steinberg. He got consumed with something that cost him in the end his life, but in the very end, he was my friend as much as he was when we started. It, it left a, an empty spot here. Losing Billy was hard on Steinbrenner and marked a tragic end to a difficult decade. But even for times were on the horizon, for it was George who would soon become the news. Coming up on Yankeeography. When he came back, the ball club had already been improved. We looked like we had a nucleus. Oh, Yankees win! To see the joy in his eyes, it was real. As the 1990s got underway, George Steinbrenner found himself in the midst of controversy. 
Baseball Commissioner Faye Vincent had suspended the boss for his role in trying to obtain information through a gambler to use against Dave Winfield as part of an ongoing feud. The ban was for life. I will be, as you know, uh, resigning as general partner, managing general partner uh, sometime today. Everybody makes mistakes, and uh, certainly I made my share. This was Steinbrenner's second suspension since purchasing the Yankees. In 1974, he was suspended for 15 months by Commissioner Bowie Kuhn after he made illegal contributions to President Richard Nixon's re-election campaign. In neither case am I bitter. I realize that both men, both Faye and Bowie, did what they felt they had to do for the best interests of baseball at the time. Vincent's lifetime ban would be reduced to three years. And during that time, George entrusted the team to general manager Gene Stick Michael. In his effort to make the Yankees contenders once again, Stick made some shrewd trades and signed veteran free agents while young talent developed down on the farm. I would like to make it to the big leagues, of course, but just, you know, one step at a time. And in time, those steps paid dividends. Michael had assembled a team filled with promise, a thoughtful welcome back gift for the boss. When he came back, the ball club had already been improved. We looked like we had a nucleus. Come 1994, the Yankees were in first place and appeared headed to the playoffs for the first time in more than a decade. But still another strike brought those plans and the season to a grinding halt. As the 95 season got underway, Steinbrenner was determined that the Yankees remain focused and ready to build off their success the year prior. There is a job to be finished, and uh, I think this team has a reasonable chance of being there at the end. The New York Yankees have won the 1995 first ever wild card. For the first time in 14 years, the Yankees were playing baseball in October, and no one was prouder of this accomplishment than the boss. This was a courageous team. They didn't know how to quit. But their pride came just before their fall to the Seattle Mariners in heartbreaking fashion. It left Steinbrenner shell-shocked. This is the toughest loss that you've experienced in, oh, in, in all your sporting career. I think probably it's one of the toughest, yeah. I can tell you, standing in the clubhouse, when it didn't happen, uh, about as upset as I've ever seen him. What's ahead then, George? We'll see. True to form, George went right to work to make the team better for 1996. And the biggest move he made was also the most criticized. People were wondering why George Steinbrenner would pick this loser to manage his New York Yankee ball club. The selection of Tory sparked a wild fire of second guessing by the media and fans, especially considering that Joe's three previous managerial jobs had produced just one playoff appearance. But George stood by his man. I knew Joe Torrey. I knew he was a New Yorker. I thought that I could help Joe, and I knew he could help me, and he'd be a good manager. And it was in that redemptive spirit, George also signed Dwight Gooden and Darryl Strawberry, two former Mets superstars. He was convinced that given the chance, both men could help the team. When Dad sees people down, he's driven even that much more to make an impact in their life. He's a very genuine person. He's a person that um, has a deep uh, concern uh, about people's lives. He was more concerned about how I was doing, you know, off the field. So uh, right then I knew that he cared more about me as a person than a player. A you want to gloat over all those people that argued with you? You should never have brought Strawberry and Gooden back, two young men that turned their lives around gloriously and contributed so much to winning. Which is precisely what the Yankees did, capturing their division and then moving on to the fall classic. The Yankees win the pennant. For the first time since 1981, the boss was back in the World Series, where his team proceeded to get drugged by Atlanta in Game 1. But instead of feeling despair, Steinbrenner was surprisingly buoyed following a chat with his manager. Joe Torre telling me after we'd lost the first one that we weren't focused and he didn't think we could win the second game here. But then he looked at me and says, don't worry about it, we're going to Atlanta. 
I said, that's my town. And I felt like saying, oh, Jesus, are we in trouble, you know? We'll win three games there and then come back and win it for you Saturday night. But that's exactly what he did. It'll be a 3-2. The stretch and pitch. Popped up again. Off third. Hayes makes the catch. Yankees win. The Yankees win. When it was all over. Represents all New York because they don't quit. New Yorkers don't quit. And this team, more than any I've seen, exemplifies that spirit. Steinbrenner had successfully returned the Yankees to the top of the baseball world, where they'd stay for quite some time. Ball game over. World Series over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. The New York Yankees have once again reached the summit of the sports world. They've won their third straight championship, fourth in the last five years. The Yankees were just the fourth team ever to capture three straight titles, and each year an old friend was there to hand the boss his crown. I knew that this was a dream since 1981. It was the last time he had been in a World Series. So it was a privilege for both of us. You've set a standard of excellence for the rest of baseball and, frankly, for the rest of society to follow. Congratulations. Thanks, bud. It was remarkable. It may be the last dynasty we'll have in this sport for a long time to come. This run of Yankee dominance under Steinbrenner's watch was truly special. And so was a reunion 14 years in the making, one orchestrated by a member of the Yankee family. And I said, George, I want to talk to you about Yogi. And he stopped. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, uh, oh, n nothing. But I knew he was interested. So in an atmosphere of forgiveness, George came to meet Yogi at his museum, where playful banter broke the ice. Yogi, I know you were a little nervous pacing around uh, waiting for George. Yeah, he was late. Well, I came a long way. God, I came all the way from Florida. I'm glad we buried the hatchet. We did. He, he admit the mistake and everything. And, well, I did too. I was mad, you know. It was a great thing. But their rekindled friendship was just the start. For George felt that to properly celebrate his return, Yogi needed a special day in his honor. And it certainly turned into a memorable occasion. Well, I want to thank you all for making me feel right at home. God bless you. Thank you. For a while, the ceremony was touching. The game that followed was perfect. David Cohn has attained baseball immortality. It was a Hollywood ending that Steinbrenner himself couldn't have scripted any better. That was a great thing, being able to get together with him. I just feel he's great. He's back part of the Yankees. I love him. Welcome back to this special edition of Yankeeography. When you think of what he started with in 1973 and where we are today, uh, it, it, it's incredible. The New York Yankees, for the fourth time in five years, are the world champions. He was the person who innovated where people thought the brand could never go. Starting with free agency in the 70s, George always seemed to be one step ahead of everyone else. If you're going to compete with Mr. Steinbrenner, uh, you got to get up real early in the morning. You have to keep up with the times. Television has made, made it so that so much more is available to the public, competing for their viewership or their sports dollar. And you've got to give the public what they want. George got what he wanted in 1986 when he signed a $500 million deal with MSG Network. But he soon realized he could drastically increase revenues if he owned his own network. Yes, the Yankees Entertainment and Sports Network. George took that Yankee brand to a new level of excellence, and that's something not easy to do. But creating the Yes Network was just one of many groundbreaking deals Steinbrenner made throughout the years to parlay the Yankees into a global brand, positioning his franchise to finance most of the new stadium. The Steinbrenner family deserves a lot of credit for building a, a, a palace. George always wanted to give the fans of New York, the people of New York and Yankee fans all over, the very best. We're just happy that we're able to do this for the Yankees and happy to do it for you people. And enjoy the new stadium. I hope it's wonderful. This is a testament for everything that's happened since 1973. The guy was a visionary. The guy is a visionary. Yes, he can be a tough businessman. 
He can be a really tough businessman and um, very difficult to work for and all of those things. But there's a kinder side. My dad once told me that if you do something good for someone and more than two people know about it, you didn't do it for the right reason. Although he kept them low key, Steinbrenner did many good things. George uh, has been charitable across the board. So there's no one way to describe it. If you could look at a particular interest of his, it's been men and women in uniform. We have the gold shield here in Tampa and the silver shield, which gives scholarships to firefighters and police officers killed in the line of duty. Same thing with Special Operations Warrior Foundation for our military, same, same deal. Anybody killed in the line of duty, their children, their, their four years of college are taken care of. I just want to express my personal thanks to George. He has been a very strong supporter of the New York City Police Department and fire departments. I think it's long overdue that, that we recognize these men and ladies. I'm sure he has sent more kids to college paying for their tuition than we'll ever know. Steinbrenner's emphasis on education led him to become involved in the annual Whitney Young Classic football game to benefit a scholarship fund. Ever the Patriot, he extended his support to young athletes in many sports when he became a vice president of the U.S. Olympic Committee in 1989. He wanted the U.S. to win gold medals. He wanted to do whatever was necessary in terms of developing the right support, the right approach. We made dramatic changes, and it's already paid off. We won more medals than ever before on foreign soil. In the Winter Olympics and in the Summer Olympics in Barcelona, most medals in 90-some years. Still, it's in the Bronx where George has done some of his finest work. Just ask the young man who first encountered the boss while spray painting graffiti outside Yankee Stadium. Next thing you know, there's a hand on my collar. Next thing you know, I'm being handed a uniform. And that night, I'm the bat boy for the New York Yankees. The man says to me, if you want to keep this job, you will uh, do well in school and you won't ever do any graffiti outside Yankee Stadium again. And that man was George Steinbrenner. His story is just a microcosm of how George has helped so many in the borough. The Bronx has been so wonderful to us, and we have really believe in giving back to the Bronx. And thus was born the New York Yankees Foundation. With the foundation, we've always worked with the area. The Yankees have been so supportive of putting money back into the Bronx, as well as in the New York community. That kindness extends to George's other home. There are a lot of people in Tampa Bay that have been touched by him. A lot of families that have prospered, a lot of little league teams, a lot of police officers, a lot of kids, on and on and on. The Boys and Girls Luncheon uh, is something that we've been doing for many years. And that's not an event where you maybe can't go to it. And that stems from Mr. Steinbrenner's involvement. It was no surprise in 2008 when the Tampa Bay Boys and Girls Club named their building after the man who'd given them so much. So too did St. Joseph's Hospital in Tampa name their pediatric wing after the Yankees owner following a scare in the family. My daughter who was very sick and she was two months old and he came with me to the hospital and we waited outside of the emergency room for two and a half hours before they could see her. Affected by his personal experience, George donated money to have a special children's wing built. And there's more. It's quite a gift that Tampa has given him to name a school after him. I think he's been blown away. The city even proposed changing the name of Legends Field to honor Mr. Steinbrenner. When they came to us with it at first, he was hesitant. Uh, but we told him, you know, it's something that should be done. They all want to do it. And you deserve it. This is about the community in its small... Ladies and gentlemen, the New York Yankees and the Steinbrenner family now present to you George M. Steinbrenner Field. I love the name Legends Field and what it stood for, but it couldn't be more appropriate. I mean, uh, it should be named more. Long after I'm gone and George Steinbrenner's gone and so forth, the school will live on, and so will Steinbrenner Field, and so will his legacy. A legacy born of compassion and generosity. I doubt if there has ever been a more philanthropic personage in the history of sport than George Steinbrenner. He gives to anybody who walks up to him. I mean, that's the amazing thing to me. He is, he's been such a generous, generous individual. He has a huge heart, and he's committed to making a difference. 
That's part of what makes life pleasurable for him, is helping other people. The good you do for others always comes back to you. And I guess that's the way I look at it. Although George Steinbrenner was comfortable in public, he was extremely private when it came to his family. What kind of pose would you like? <laughs> Happy pose? <laughs> There's no doubt he didn't want us in the spotlight, and, uh, you know, he had the right idea. Now, when I look back on it, I would want the same for my children. I think he just tried to protect us the best way he knew how. My father, to the world, is a larger-than-life figure, but from a daughter's point of view, He's this amazing family man. It's a side most people don't know. He was very busy, so he did travel a fair amount. But when he was home, uh, you know, he was, he was dad. Well, he came to my college during the middle of a World Series. He would just show up, and all of a sudden we'd look and, and hear his voice in the crowd. It didn't matter what it was. If his kids were doing it, he was going to be there. And that's been across the board, and even more so with our grandchildren. Every swim meet, every baseball little league game, he would come to the t-ball games, just t-ball, and he'd start yelling at the umpire, my like, dad, please, this is just t-ball. These are probably just dads. He cares so much about his children and his grandchildren and his family. I love my grandchildren, but boy, they can tire you out. I mean, I'm, I'm ready to collapse after their visit. He's been there every important event of our lives and has given us a sense of family, which very few people have in this world anymore. And for the family, the life lessons George taught them remain indelible. My favorite memory is very small. They used to have a swing sitting in front of the main house, and I would sit there oftentimes in high school and just be thinking, and he would come out and sit next to me on the swing and would talk at length. No matter what it was, you know, he would be out there on that swing. He gave us an undying sense of loyalty, probably to a fault. Humbleness has always been ingrained in our heads, particularly when it comes to how you deal with other organizations and how you give back to the community. Just be kind to everyone. It's about the difference that you make in this world. That's one of the largest lessons. Always try to be there for your family. You know, that will run throughout, you'll see, through probably all of us. It was like being around a good dad and being around a professor, you know, at the same time. And I think he inevitably was always a coach, always a coach of, of life in every way. And he has entrusted his children to carry on everything from the ball club to the Yankees Foundation and, of course, Kinsman Farms. Kinsman Farm is about 800 acres. We have various barns for different stages of the horse's development. Jenny, come here. Hi, baby girl. Hey. He's always had a love for all animals. And oftentimes here on Kinsman, he'd be wandering around in the paddocks, and the horses would come running to him. And as children, we had no idea how he had that effect on the horses when we couldn't get them to come to us. And many years later, we realized he carried little cubes of sugar in his pocket. Well, the one thing about the horse, he cannot talk to the sports riders. So I like my horses because I can go out there and say, you bum, you got to do better, and pat him on the cheek and hope that he goes. Originally, he went into the business because he wanted the racing aspect of it, but he also turned to the breeding to have the ultimate ends of the racehorse. This is Jenny Joy. This was a winner for Kinsman. I decided to name her first foal after my dad. His name is Yankee Boss, and his father is English Channel, who is one of the greatest turf horses of all times, and we have very high hopes for him. <laughs> has taken a lot of pride in the horses that he's bred through the years. He's always held on to the mares, looking forward to breeding them, and they ran well. George has always been driven by a will to win. And in the case of the horses, that meant the run for the roses. He loves horse racing uh, every bit as much as baseball. I like to win a, a Kentucky Derby. I've been in the Derby, but I've never won it. If my dad were to win the Kentucky Derby, I think that would be right up there with winning the World Series. He has wanted the Kentucky Derby as long as I can remember him, and hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to deliver that for him. A Renaissance man and a showman, George never shied away from the national stage, and some of his cameos will live on forever. George was all over television. He was never shy. Then Billy Martin got him involved with the Miller Lite commercials. No, Bill, it tastes great. Less filling, George. Billy, it tastes great. Less filling, George. Billy, 
Yeah, George. You're fired. Oh, not again. Kudos to the writers for that one, because they uh, they did a good job, and they, they played it perfectly. But the, the Visa ones were great, too. You're our starting shortstop. How can you possibly afford to spend two nights dancing, two nights eating out, and three nights just carousing with your friends? He's a natural-born actor. He, he does he does good with that. He doesn't, doesn't shy away from the camera. Oh. A true measure of George's universal appeal came when he hosted Saturday Night Live, and he played the part to perfection. He sure is cute, isn't he? Yeah, like an angel. Oh, how could Dave Winfield not like this guy? I loved George when he hosted Saturday Night Live. Where is it written? If you don't get results right away, you fire people. What kind of an asinine policy is that? <laughs> but he enjoyed it, just came right out on stage and... Started nailing everything. He's a character. He's always playing games, always telling jokes. He's really a funny guy. I can't fire people. It's not in my nature. <laughs> Steinbrenner was convincing playing himself. Nobody could uh, replicate George Steinbrenner. You can't have people worried all the time that they'll be fired if they make one mistake. That's lunacy. Only a jackass would run his business. Then. You learn this. You can't poke some fun at yourself. You're not much of a man. George also allowed others to poke fun of his larger-than-life persona when he was portrayed on the hit show Seinfeld. I like Seinfeld very much. Costanzo, wh what is that you're reading over there? That looks pretty tasty. It's a calzone, sir. Calzone, huh? Yeah, let's see it. Pass that on down. Let's get a little look at that. Big Stein wants a little taste. Come on. Come on. People ask me, did it bother him? No, it didn't bother him. I mean, you know, if anything, he, he'll be the first guy that'll laugh at himself. You know, people don't realize that. Very good. Excellent. Excellent little calzone you got there, Costanzo. Okay. A little jealous. All right. Here we go. They poke fun at me, and then it's accurate. Everybody out. I got a plan on my mind. Costanzo, go get me a couple of calzones right now. Prado, move it out. Big Stein wants an eight pipe calzone. He must have one. I thought he did a good job. I mean, that's, you know, that's a tough thing to do for somebody that's not in the entertainment business. In 2000, George Steinbrenner's Yankees captured their fourth championship in five years. The most successful team in the history of professional sports. But the 2001 season would be truly unique as George and the Yankees came to bat for both New York and the country. The boss steps up in so many ways uh, when unfortunate circumstances hit and when our country was attacked. This team especially got in a position to kind of uplift the city. For a few days there, it was almost like nothing else in the world mattered other than everybody around you was safe. And you were almost embarrassed when people would talk about baseball at that time. George Steinbrenner knew the importance of sports in this country. Anybody that I could get my hands on, I would give him a hug and I would greet him in a very warm way because I, I knew that he was more than baseball. By the end of it all, it was almost a good feeling to know that for a while we took people away from the horrible things that were happening. On September 23rd, 2001, Steinbrenner opened the doors to Yankee Stadium so it could be used as a sanctuary for prayer, and he did so without hesitation. I called George personally, and George said, you can have it for a week. You can have it for as long as you want. We were accompanied by religious leaders of every faith to offer a prayer for the families of those who have been lost, to offer a prayer for our city, and to offer a prayer for America. To see the New York Yankees give their baseball stadium for this to be done it says something very important happened around all of this. Right after 9-11, everybody played God Bless America in the seventh inning stretch. God bless America. It's actually a directive that I put out, but I didn't have to put it out because George was already doing it. And, and I think it's wonderful. George is a patriot. My whole sweet and that spirit of patriotism carried over to the World Series. The 2001 World Series was very unique because of the games that were played and because of the time that it took place so close after September 11th. There was so much emotion. George's Yankees fought gallantly. Their comebacks captivated the nation. A World Series title would have been the perfect ending, but baseball doesn't follow a script. And the Arizona Diamondbacks are the 2001 
The Yankees' compassion in the wake of 9-11 made them America's team that October, but George saw an even greater calling. I do believe we are a global team. The Yankees are the biggest name in baseball, no matter what anybody else in baseball says. And now we have arranged a partnership with the Giants in Japan. And that association led to the signing of a monster talent. This man is a national hero. He really is, truly. You can tell by the media that goes where he goes. And they could not have sent us a better example of a good young man. And following in the legacy of past team leaders, George made a decision. We're here to announce the appointment on behalf of Mr. Steinbrenner of Derek Jeter as the captain of the Yankees. I'd like to thank the boss, obviously, for uh, giving me this title, and it's something that I, I will always treasure, and you know, I'll do it to the best of my ability. But come the end of 2003, George's tireless efforts began to take their toll. I was home for the holidays, I was on the freeway, and I got a phone call from some of my superiors saying, just so you know, that Mr. Steinbrenner suffered an episode at Otto Graham's funeral. After the incident with Otto Graham's funeral, it caused George to pause and realize that he's mortal. I'm getting ready to let the young elephants into the tent. Everybody's got to do that sometime. I'm a little late in getting it done because I wasn't where I wanted to go. George had acknowledged that a transition was necessary for the betterment of the team. And en route to a live pregame television interview prior to the 2004 home opener, he received a standing ovation from the fans and was overwhelmed by their response. We couldn't help but notice that, how, how emotional you got when Warren started talking to you. It's a very important thing that we, we, we hold the, the strings to. This is the people's team. George, for years and years, talked about turning this over to the young elephants. It's finally happened. His offspring learned from the master. We all now see how very difficult that was, as we all try very hard <laughs> to do one man's job with four of us. He was a very strong businessman. And in the image of their father, the family continues to make moves to build a championship team. 35 years, my dad has tried everything and he could to put a championship caliber team on the field. And that's not going to change. It hasn't changed. It won't change because the fans deserve it. George also felt the fans deserved a new stadium. And in 2006, they broke ground on their new home. I don't think there's anyone who would argue if you call this the house that George built. George Steinbrenner's ownership of the Yankees doesn't go on forever, but this building's here for a long time. And everyone will know that it was because of the success he had as an owner. Yankee Stadium will be home to countless new memories. But for George, it would be tough to top what happened in the old one. For years, we would talk every now and then, and I would say, why don't you go out on the field at the stadium? Why don't you throw out the first pitch? Why don't you get introduced? And he'd go, no, 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 I, I don't want to do that. They would boo me. I said, no, they wouldn't. They realize what you've meant to this franchise and what you've meant to them as fans. You should do it. The 2008 All-Star Game was the final jewel event ever held at Old Yankee Stadium. Everywhere you looked, baseball royalty adorned the field, but one question remained unanswered. Would George Steinbrenner be in attendance? There have been so many whispers about was George going to be there, was George not going to be there. If he was, would he be on the field? Would they just show him in the box? Nobody really knew what to expect when it came to George, but everybody figured it's Yankee Stadium, it's the All-Star Game, he's got to be involved somehow. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are honored to have a very special guest deliver the baseballs to the pitcher's mound for the ceremonial first pitch. Please direct your attention now to left field and welcome the boss, Mr. George. The fans realize how important George Steinbrenner has been to the New York Yankees, to New York City, to all of baseball. But it was not only the fans that recognized that. It was the love and the outpouring of the players who came and met him at home plate. They realized how important he was. The greatest moment that I have ever had in, in Yankee Stadium. teary-eyed and sympathetic and emotional for my friend. You know, to see him starting to become mortal, he was a lion. 
that was enjoyable to watch in action. The final season in legendary Yankee Stadium did not end with ultimate victory, as would have been a fitting punctuation to years of glory. The opening of the new Yankee Stadium across the street the following season would be George's lasting legacy to the team and its fans. Making it even more special, the Yankees would roar into the World Series determined to claim still another title. Go, let's go! And with Steinbrenner watching from back home in Tampa, his Yankees christened the new stadium with its first championship, the team's 27th and George's 7th. Two down in the ninth inning. To the second baseman, Cano. The Yankees are back. Seventh time. Ball game over. World Series over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. It was a victory the organization and all Yankee fans would dedicate to the boss. Dad, I know you're at home watching with mom. This one is for you. The Yankees set out to defend their title in 2010, and by the All-Star break, they were in first place in the American League East. And the Yankees have the win for their 28th road win of the season. That is tied for the most in baseball. But on the morning of the All-Star game, just two days after the passing of the Yankees' legendary PA announcer Bob Shepard, the Yankees' family and all of baseball received some very sad news. This morning, Yankees principal owner and chairperson George M. Steinbrenner III passed away at the age of 80. The continuing big news story of the day on this All-Star Tuesday, the passing at the age of 80 of Yankees owner George M. Steinbrenner. How'd you find out about that this morning? It's tough because he's more than just an owner to me. You know, he's a friend of mine, and um, he'll be deeply missed. Well, it's um, a very sad day. I've known George now almost four decades. He clearly was a giant in this sport. When the team returned home following the break, a ceremony was held to honor both Shepard and the boss, icons in their own right, and men who will never be forgotten. When Mr. Steinbrenner passed away, it was definitely the end of an era. He was the greatest and is the greatest owner in, in sports history. And what we like to remember about Mr. Steinbrenner is he went out a champion. We won the World Series in his last year. And then at the All-Star break, we were in first place. His last memories were of his Yankees being in first place, and that's the way it should be. On September 20th, 2010, the Yankees enshrined Mr. Steinbrenner in the best possible fashion with a memorial of his own in Monument Park, where he joined the rest of the Yankee Immortals. And tonight, George Steinbrenner will enter a rarefied piece of real estate, and that is in Monument Park. The Steinbrenner family stood proud during the emotional ceremony as the organization paid homage to the man who had done so much for the city, the team, and its fans. Yankee greats, both past and present, stood strong as one for the owner who ran this team for 38 seasons. You see Reggie Jackson and David Wells. Don Mattingly is on the field along with Joe Torre. The family will now unveil the George M. Steinbrenner III monument.
George Steinbrenner is to our era of baseball, in a way, what George Herman Ruth was to his era of baseball. The great soul, the great personality, the big presence. I care about the team like other Yankee fans care about it, and all I can point to is the record. Since I've had the team in 73, we've won more games than any other team in baseball. And that's what it's all about. I think George's legacy, more than anything else, will be the rejuvenation of the Yankees because he took them to new levels of excellence and really kept them there. The greatest owner in all sports. A guy who demanded championships. That's what I liked about playing for him, is that every year he expected us to go out there and win the World Series. The only thing that I miss more than winning is breathing. Anything short of that was a disappointment. 125 wins, historically an absolutely magnificent performance. Congratulations. Thanks, bud. In George's case, it was this insatiable appetite for winning. That's what he will always be remembered for, and properly so. Where does this one rank? right at the top this is truly you can say it now one of the greatest teams in baseball as all of society becomes more homogenized more impersonal we value the characters we value the ones who are different and we value the ones who are confident enough of their own presence on this planet to be who they are George was such a person. I have a sign on my desk that says, lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. And if I'm the leader, I'm going to be the leader, and I'm going to lead him to the best of my ability. When people talk about George Steinbrenner, they're going to sort of giggle a little bit and say what a tough SOB he was. And the only thing I care about is Yankee fans. I could care less what the other people or the detractors say. It really doesn't bother me. Whatever it is that created that massive force is what it is, and he used it to a fairly well. They sold their soul to George Steinbrenner because of the money. That's baloney. Those guys could go anywhere and get the money. Believe me, they could. What he brought to the game was that this organization, through him, set the example of how an organization should be run, how it should carry itself, the commitment it should have to its fans and its, its city. I love New York. I love the Yankees. I love everything that the mystique of the Yankees represents. He's kept the Yankees true to what we are, the finest sports franchise in the world. To me, that's the greatest gift he's given. When you think about candidates who are eligible for the Hall of Fame, especially executives, you look for great sportsmen. You look for guys that help lead their franchises successfully and had a positive impact on the game. He's had more impact on the game than any other owner in the last 35 years. And in my opinion, he belongs in the Hall of Fame for that reason. Would you raise your hands if you picked the Yankees to win the World Series? Okay. <laughs> Good man. Good man. I don't think he gets the credit for what a wonderful man he really is, because I think people always envision him as being a tough boss. But he really, truly cares about people more than anything. He would read the paper one day, and there'd be somebody that needed help, and he would be the first one to jump in there and help them. He's done that his entire life. He'll not be forgotten. And for all the people that he touched, he should never be forgotten. When the Yankees win, it's good for baseball, because baseball history is Yankee history and my dad's the one that restored that. George is an original. There's never going to be another George Steinbrenner. When you look back at George Steinbrenner's time as owner of the Yankees, one thing stands out. For beyond the triumphs and tragedies, the hirings and firings that became his trademark, he simply wanted to win. George had the utmost respect for Yankee tradition and the fans. He was determined to first revive the pinstripe pride and then take it to new heights. And he did everything within his power to make that happen, pouring all his resources back into the team. George Steinbrenner's commitment and dedication to giving Yankee fans a winner has been unmatched, the likes of which we may never see again. For the Yes Network, I'm John Sterling, and thanks for watching Yankeeography.